Good evening. Uh, welcome. I'm Bill Brown of Brookings Mountain West. Welcome to our fifth lecture of the fall. Uh, we'll be on a slight hiatus uh, looking at the calendar. Our next public lecture won't be until February 10th when uh, Rebecca Winthrop will be here. Uh, she'll be talking also on an education related topic. She is a fellow at Brookings Institution and uh, co-director of the Center on Universal Education. So while Tom's going to, Tom Lovelace will talk tonight about some K through 12 issues, Rebecca has the uh, definition of the big picture since she, <laughs> universal education. She'll be looking at some global issues of education in developing countries. So if you can join us on the 10th, that would be great. Check out our website for updates on uh, what's going on here. We'll be publishing our Mountain Monitor in December, our economic analysis of the region and other things will be going on besides our public lectures. Uh, if you have a, a cell phone uh, or a pager, if you could silence it, that would be great. I know you'll have questions for Tom, so we do have microphones in the room, but if you could sort of yell them out so everybody in the room can hear, that would be great. And before I introduce Tom, I have to ask a question given his title tonight. How many of you think students have too much homework? Every student raised their hand, right? <laughs> How many of you don't? I'm just curious to, we'll see if your opinion changes at all after Tom gets through. Our speaker tonight, Tom Lovelace, is a fellow at Brookings. He's an education specialist on, on K through 12 education reform, education policy, student assessment. He's a former sixth grade teacher and a former Harvard professor. I'll let him tell you which of those two is the harder <laughs> job. Uh, but uh, please uh, w join me in welcoming Tom. Thank you, uh, Bill, and thank you for having me here. Um, glad you could all come out and make it tonight. Um, this question, do students have too much homework? I'll tell you what was the impetus of the study. And that was in 2001, so about nine years ago, uh, a number of popular press magazines started running stories about kids just overwhelmed with homework, just crushed by the burden of homework. And uh, this interested me as an old school teacher. Um, is it in fact true? Because the one thing the articles had in common is they had very little data. And in fact, the one study they cited, I'm going to show you some things about that study, uh, which the, the, the headline that, for instance, Time Magazine brought from that study was that homework now had even gotten down to the ages of three to five year olds, and that their homework load had doubled since from the 1980s until uh, the late 1990s. So I'm gonna show you that, that data. And little kids, you know, six to eight years old, same thing, their homework had doubled. Uh, so at the Brown Center, we ask questions that we can bring empirical data to bear, hopefully to answer them, and that's what uh, I'll do. What I've done is taken the 2001 study and I keep updating it. So it's been refreshed with new data. Here's some of those headlines I told you about. Here's Newsweek. Notice the troubled child with books on his head. Um, homework doesn't help. Every night millions of parents, I'm sorry, it's a little fuzzy as we reproduced it, but millions of parents and kids shed blood, sweat, and tears over the kitchen table. Here's a People magazine. People got into the act. Overbooked. Notice the child's face, not a happy camper. Um, obviously, homework's a problem. And then my favorite, Time Magazine, the homework ate my family. Kids are dazed, parents are stressed. Look at the cover, too much homework. So what do we know about this topic? And I will say, too, that of all the studies we've done at the Brown Center, and I think we've done something like 40 in the last 10 years, this one caused the most controversy, at least measured by emails from high school kids uh, to me. And they were, they were charming. Some of them, I had over 500 emails actually over, just over this one study. And some of them, of course, had little emoticons going, you know, Mr. Lovelace, this is you. And then it explode on the screen. And it was, it was really fun. Because the basic answer to the question is if you take homework in the context of, of the last 20 or 30 years, there's really two answers to the question. One is kids don't have very much homework, and they really never have. So it's not as if homework is increasing. Now, here's that study, and, I, and a lot of data up here, but I want you to take a look at this bottom, this line here that's in red. It's studying. 
And this is, a, this is one of the great social science experiments ever, I think, and here's how it's done. It's a study of how families use their time, and um, there were two samples drawn, one in 1981, and they conducted, you can see the N up there is only 61, so it's a smaller sample in, in 81. They repeat it in 97. But what they did is they took families randomly selected, and they gave the, all the family members a beeper. And then they'd beep the family members randomly, which gives it a scientific cast, a random sample of their time, and ask them to report, they punched in numbers, what they were doing, okay? And it's really interesting. Um, I think it's gonna be repeated again in the next five years or so. Now let's take a look at that. Remember I told you about the little kids and all the homework? Take a look, this is weekly time studying. And the little babies, the three to five year olds, they spent 25 minutes per week in the 81 sample on studying. And this could be flashcards of letters and numbers. It could be really anything. And then in 1997, it went up to 36 minutes per week. That's five minutes a day in a seven day week. So it went up about a minute and a half a day. And that is 44%. So they're right on the percentage increase. But this, I don't think many children are gonna die you know, five minutes a day of looking at flashcards. Now, this group doubled 52 minutes to two hours of homework. Again, per week, those are the ages six through eight. And uh, I was an elementary school teacher. Uh, this does not seem like an extraordinary amount of homework to me, two hours per week. It, you, when you're teaching reading, you assign reading stories. The kids take them home. That's studying. And then you can see the nine through 12 year olds you're getting into a, a larger load. And then here's the entire group averaged out. And you can see homework indeed went up from the two samples, but not a lot. Not really a lot when you're looking at a seven day week. If you use only a five day week and say, well, weekends, forget about that. You can't possibly have homework done. You're still just talking about 23 more minutes a week for all the kids in the, in the study. Um, the other thing is I actually got the data from Michigan, and I took a look and I asked the question, well, how many kids had any homework at all? Because there are a bunch of kids and there were zeros. And it turned out, if Time Magazine actually had looked at that, the headline might have been, percentage of kids with any homework at all decreases. It went down, actually, that age three through five group, it actually went down to 17%. Okay, the rest, the rest are zeros. These are the kids with any homework at all. Here's the group where homework went up, ages six through eight, the percentage of kids with any homework at all. Nine through 12 decreased, and among all the children in the sample, the homework uh, actually went down. Now probably the best source we have for homework over time is NAEP, N-A-E-P. Uh, it's also known as the Nation's Report Card. It's a federal government sample, random sample of kids they are tested intermittently. They have been since the early 70s. And they started asking about homework in 1980 with uh, ages 13 and 17 year olds. And age nine, they started in 84. I've, I've provided the 88 data. But let's take a look at this. And this will give us a good idea of how homework has changed the burden over time. There has been a, an increase, but, it's, but it's, you're gonna see, it's only among a very select group of kids. Take a look at the bottom row of the three groupings. The kids that are really could make a claim of being overworked. They have over two hours a night. And you can see that's pretty flat. Uh, age nine, 7% in 1988, 5% in 2008, and it didn't move very much over this uh, 20 years. At age 13, 7%, it wiggles around, but it, it's still, it's not a lot of kids. So there are kids who can legitimately say, I have a lot of homework. They might be the ones that wind up on the cover of Time Magazine. But when you're talking about all kids in the country, it doesn't appear that that group is, is really you know, expanding. It's not over half the kids or anything. It's really a, a minority. And then at age 17, these are seniors, about 10% in 1980, about 10% in 2008. Now, here's the group that's actually where you can see some statistical movement. Now, look at the, look at the first two rows of each table. None of, these are the kids who don't do any homework. There are two reasons why kids don't do homework. One, none's assigned. And the second, it's assigned they don't do it. Um, by the way, the good part about this study, the nice thing is the question, because they ask, when you ask kids if they have homework, they always say they do. But if you ask them a specific question, did you have any last night? 
you get a much more accurate reading. It's, it's a much more valid reading, and that's what Nape asks. Now take a look at the none assign and did not do it. Let's, let's start with age nine. So in 1988, that totals to 33%. And you can see that that group has shrunk down to 23% in 2008. And where it's going, the group with no homework is going into the group of less than one hour. See how that goes up? 47 to 60 among nine-year-olds, 32 to 43. These are our middle schoolers, age 13. And then here, 24 to 27. And our seniors in high school, high school kids, that's where you see the least movement of homework. It, it really, they don't have very much, they never have, and they still don't. So when you take those two top rows, what's the percentage of kids who report less than an hour of daily homework? The two top rows plus less than an hour, either they have none or they have less than an hour. Here are the percentages. Nine-year-olds, 83% have less than an hour. 13-year-olds, 73%. 17-year-olds, 67%. Um, one group that's been sampling homework is called the Horatio Alger Association, and they have a, a neat study from 2001. I'm going to share that in just a second. But here's their latest one from 2008. And they do see a slight rise in homework. This is of teenagers. This is ages 13 through 19. So it includes middle schoolers and high school kids. And you can see the 2008 data. If you look at the blue bar, that's the percentage of kids who have more than six hours, and that's in a week. So it's a little more than an hour a day if you only count the five days, less than an hour if you count seven. And that number from 05 went up to 08. But you can see that it's fairly stable within a, within a range. The kids with less than five hours, 52% in 2008. That's teenagers. Now, here's why I say the 2001 study I thought was very interesting that Horatio Alger did. They, they looked at a different factor, and that is jobs. Um, I, I do a lot of studies of international education. The United States is an outlier on our teens working. In no other country of the world do half, half of our teens usually are working at any given school year. By the time the typical kid finishes high school, they've worked, about 60% of them have had a job at some point. And if you, if you talk to the high achieving countries like in Asia or in Europe, and you, you talk to educators or parents, how many of your kids work? They just, they look at you like, it's a stigma actually. They go, what? Why would my kid be working? You know, they, have, they have jobs, it's called school. Uh, in the United States, we have a whole different like, idea that work you know, creates uh, better rounded citizens and we have a mythology about work and we, we put a lot of value in kids having jobs. So what's the relationship between this and homework? Well, there's an inverse relationship. The kids who work a lot tend to, have, don't, they don't spend much time on homework and vice versa. So they asked the question about a homework being a priority and take a look at statement B. I never have the time for homework, 49%. These are high school kids. And here's where you start to see that inverse relationship. The blue bars, these are of the kids who had a job. Okay, and in 2001, 43% of these high school kids had a job. And the blue bar shows you the amount of time they spent on homework. The red bar shows you the amount of time they spent on their jobs. So let's just look at the red bars and let's start clear to the right. 27% worked more than 20 hours a week at their job. 26% worked 16 to 20 hours at their job. This is per week. Now it's very important about those two red bars on the right, we do have some evidence that working is fine until you spend more than 15 hours per week and then grades start suffering. So the kids in the two bars on the right, which are 53% of these high schoolers, they are at risk then of their grades suffering because of their, they're spending a lot of time in jobs. And many of these jobs are things where they're you know, closing a Taco Bell at midnight on a school night, this kind of thing. States have labor laws about this, but they're not rigorously enforced. So of the kids who spend five hours or less on homework, it's 57% of this group that work. So the, the workers tend not to have very much homework. 
Now, what about an, a different population? And when, when I show these data, and there are college professors in the audience, they, they usually groan and say, oh, that explains a lot. Um, this is kid, this is a survey, it's been done since 1966. It really has a lot of data. So we, every year it's done. And it's a survey of college freshmen in four-year institutions like UNLV. And they ask these college freshmen, how much homework did you have in your senior year of high school? Now, think about the sample before you even look at the numbers. These are our best students. Any kid who gets out of high school and goes immediately uh, to work is not part of this sample. Any kid who dropped out of high school is not part of the sample. Any kid who goes in the military is not part of the sample. So these are our top students. And 63.6% .6 of them said when they were in high school, they had five hours or less of homework. Almost two thirds. By the way, these numbers are hitting uh, kind of record levels too. This is the, this is the uh, about three years ago, when it crossed over 60%, it, it got a little bit higher, maybe 65%. But in, since 1966, so that's 44 years of surveying college freshmen, the homework load they're reporting is at the lowest ever in 44 years in high school. Now, there is this phenomenon that's, a, that's actually happened in high schools. It's kind of um, the senior year in high school now has become kind of a dead year even for the best students. You do all your great work up through the junior year, take the SATs or ACTs, get it admitted to college, and boom, you do nothing from January to June, right? You just party. And uh, so this is essentially bearing that out. But, you know, think about it. That's a lost year, and it's the year just before you enter college, and yet you'd find this nowhere else in the world. Now, if it's not studying, what are, what are high school seniors doing, right? And here's what the college freshmen report that they're doing. Now, this is a percentage of, of, of uh, college freshmen who said when they were in high school, they spent more than five hours a week, five hours a week on these various activities. So they're studying. That's in the, the middle, 36, just like we just saw in the previous slide, 36.4%. So what are kids doing? Well, 72% spend five or more hours a week socializing. Uh, American students are great socializers, and they spend a lot of time on it. Exercise or sports and working for pay, you see that, 51%. Spend a lot of time on that. Then uh, on the other side, watching TV, 26%. This number's been dropping for 20 years. TV viewing among teens is going down, not up. A lot of people don't realize that because there are other things to do on the internet and stuff. Uh, online social networks, they started asking about about 10 years ago, that's 19.5%. And then partying, 18.8%. Again, this is the college freshman. So, these Time Magazine articles and the Newsweeks and the People Magazine articles are all saying that parents are up in arms. Are parents indeed up in arms? And you have to always be careful with um, thinking that people who complain about a particular thing, they may have very real complaints, but they can be only 1% of the population or 2% of the population. You can't, just because they're loud and angry, you can't then construe that, that they're in a majority. So here's the last survey I could find. It was an AP uh, AOL poll done of parents in 06. This is the last sur survey I could find. And they all come up with basically the same results. You get about 60% of parents saying homework's about the right amount. And then the remainder divide between parents who think there's too little homework and parents who think there's too much. So 19% of parents think there's too much. And then finally, uh, here's a snapshot, a screenshot off a, a site. If you ask teenagers about homework, this is off a Cincinnati library site. Uh, how much homework should you have to do? Homework should be illegal. That was the number one response of teens, uh, 40 percent. One hour a week is plenty, 18 percent. A few hours a night, but nothing on the weekends. Uh, and then I absolutely love homework, the more the better, 8 percent. I kind of worry about that 8 percent. But uh, and what's very interesting, at w the, the statement homework should be made illegal 
sounds funny, but it actually happened in the United States history. There, there's been these waves of anti-homework. And in the 1920s, a magazine, the Ladies' Home Journal, I think it's still around, uh, Ladies' Home Journal ran this campaign trying to abolish homework because it said children should be outside playing and filling their lungs with air, and it was a health issue. Um, and the state of California, my home state, uh, which often does wacky things legislatively, banned homework, made it illegal. It was illegal. Teachers couldn't give homework. They'd be, you know, dragged into court. So here are the conclusions. The typical student, um, even in high school, does not spend more than an hour per day on homework. And we saw that from the NAEP data. The homework load has not changed much since the 1980s. We saw that too. The students whose homework increased in the last decade are those who previously had no homework and now have a small amount. That's those two rows that filter down into the less than one hour per week uh, row, and, or one hour per night row. And then most parents feel the homework load is about right. And there, are, there have been lots of surveys of parents. And homework, generally, parents do say that they think the homework load is about right. By the way, on this first point, on that there hasn't been much change, and that, it, that it's light and there hasn't been much change. Um, a colleague, Brian Gill, who's at the RAND Corporation, when I was doing this study, I ran into Brian at a conference, and as people often do, he said, you know, what are you working on? I said, I'm working on a homework thing. He says, I'm working on a homework study. And I said, interesting, what are you doing? And he said, well, I've got this database of, of, that goes back to the 1930s. And so I, I essentially have a snapshot of homework since the 1930s. And I said, well, is it going up or down or what? He goes, he goes it's just staying the same. So it's not only, you know, it appears not only to have been static just in the last 20 years, 30 years, but probably even longer than that. Just not a huge load. Now, some recommendations. Um, first, take the anti-homework articles with a grain of salt. I saw one a couple of weeks ago, actually. So this is, I think, making it a comeback. And it was blaming No Child Left Behind and testing for causing tons of homework. Uh, the PTA has guidelines on homework, and I think they just sound reasonable. Now, there's no great science behind them, but they sound reasonable. And the PTA recommendation is to parents to expect about 10 minutes per grade level per night. So if you have a second grader, about 20 minutes, third grader, 30 minutes, etc. cetera, sixth grader, 60 minutes. And by the time you get to ninth grade and start high school, about an hour and a half per day. And that seems like a reasonable benchmark, but with one caveat. Um, when I taught, I gave, I gave essentially, um, I was the kids only teacher, so it's not a problem of like different teachers piling on homework. So, I, so I, I, I'm the only person who gave them homework in all subjects, right? So I taught all subjects. And I would survey my kids about three weeks into the school year to get a feel for how they were handling the workload. And essentially, I didn't assign homework, it's just I assigned a bunch of work, we worked on it, things that weren't finished, they took home. Right? So they'd take home reading and math and, and writing and history and science almost every day. And so I surveyed them. Every year, and I taught nine years, um, the range of kids in terms of what they said they were doing in homework would go from like 15 minutes a night at the low end to three hours a night. And these were the kids getting the exact same work. Um, now there were a bunch of reasons for that. Some of that was some kids like to go to school and they don't really like to spend a lot of time working. Um, you know, all their friends are there and they'd rather socialize and do some other things. So they would take home a lot of work. Other kids are real industrious, they use their time well and, and they would take home less work. The other thing that I think goes on, that goes on too, because I would, uh, you know, any kid who said he had three hours a night, I would have conference with the parents, what's going on here? And then I, we would start hearing from the child, like their study habits. Well, first I sharpen a pencil, and then I, you know, bring the dog in so the dog can be there while I'm doing my homework, and then I kind of wash the windows, and, and they do everything but the homework, and it takes forever to get to the homework. You know what I'm saying? Um, so every child has kind of their individual way of dealing with work, and the time then can be a varying factor. So you have to be careful with that, too, even with the PTA guidelines. You have to worry about that. I think with some parents, you know, the kid disappears, goes upstairs, oh, I have homework, leaves at four o'clock, comes down at 11, oh, I still have homework, and the parent goes, my goodness, seven hours of homework, and, 
you know, the texting and stuff kind of fades into the background. Um, understand that homework varies. And then finally, uh, with parents, you know, if a homework problem exists, because I, I give this talk to a lot of parent groups, so the solution should come from parents and teachers and not from policy interventions. So state legislatures getting involved with this issue, I think, is probably a mistake. Um, school boards, some school boards say they want to ban homework and this kind of thing. You know, I can't imagine, for example, uh, being able to take an AP class and, then ha and, and be in a district where homework is banned. I, I just, I, I think you'd have to shut down AP courses because I can't imagine them being successful without some homework. So that's, uh, that's the homework story. So if you have some questions or comments or apples to throw at me or anything, yeah. Sophomore uh, students in high school? Um, the, the Horatio Alger survey, the one with the blue bars and the red bars, that's high school students. And it's, it's ages 13 through 19 on the, um, so they're in the sample, but, but they're not the only members of the sample. And then the ones that worked, those were just high school alone, but it'd be freshman through senior year. Would you expect, um, I'm sorry, do you mind if I ask another question? No, go ahead. Would you expect that there would be a, um, a large difference between homework levels in, uh, in seniors and homework levels in uh, sophomores and juniors? Because I, I've seen in what you're talking about how the, the senior year can kind of be a little bit more of an empty year. Would you expect there would be a large difference? I think there would be a difference, yes. And the middle school kids and all those homework uh, things, and I didn't point that out when we had the 7, 13, and uh, 17 up, or 9, 13, and 17. They actually appear to have the most homework. Homework appears to peak in middle school. So, and they're eighth graders. So my guess is eighth, ninth grade, uh, that's when homework peaks. And I do think you'd find, I do think if we surveyed sophomores and juniors, you're gonna find that they have more homework than the seniors. No. Yes? Uh, in your opinion, what would be the most effective amount of homework for students to have in anything? I don't know. You know, like I said, I think, the, uh, I think it depends on the kid and the subject and, and also the circumstances. Um, I, you know, I, I, I don't know. I just don't know the answer. I think the 10 minutes per grade is a decent guide to go by. Um, but I think it is so individualistic that, um, that that's only just a rough guide. Yes? Do you have anything to say about college students and their amongst homework? No, I don't. I just don't know anything about it. I don't have, uh, and I haven't seen any surveys other than the college freshman data. And oddly, they don't ask them about their homework in college in that. They ask them about their various habits in college, but not about their homework. Yes? I'm involved with a research project looking at um, middle schools that are in the Gear Up program, the uh, Gaining Early Access and Readiness for College. Yeah. And we have data right now on going four years that matches what you're showing. But one of the pieces that we've added to it is not just amount of the amount of time. Um, we've asked what kind of homework teachers assign that they actually do. And the number one response typically is worksheets and textbook questions. And consequently, nobody does it. And I guess I'm curious whether you've located any studies that really examine the kind of work that students will engage in because they find it relevant. Yeah, um, I haven't. No, I mean, I've, I've, there are lots of opinions about that out there, but I haven't seen any good um, empirical work on that. So it's hard, you know, I, I just don't know. Um, and it's, it's also the whole engagement issue. Um, sometimes the worksheets are actually a better form of homework in the sense that they structure the work. And after all, the student is on his or her own. Um, they structure the work in such a way that it can be completed on one's own. So some, sometimes, like I always felt as a teacher, and again, this is just my own opinion, that the worst thing you can do is to send homework home where, the, where it's a brand new concept. You know, and you're, you're actually then kind of sloughing off teaching on the, onto the parent. You're saying, here's a brand new idea. The kid takes it and looks at it and goes, I've never seen this before. And then the parent has to do all the teaching. And that's, to me, that's just professionally wrong. But I, I always used homework, I mean, uh, like for instance, one of the things that I, 
assigned always with homework was reading because kids sitting in a classroom, when you can be, the classroom to me is the only place where you can interact and discuss what you've read. But to do the reading, that's a solitary activity. So I think it was perfectly appropriate for kids to have an hour of reading, you know, if we were studying Lord of the Rings or something, well, they got to sit at home and read it. And then they come in and then they're able to analyze and discuss and interact with others about what they've read. But to sit in a classroom and burn off an hour of time doing what can be done alone, to me, just seemed wrong. Yeah? Countries that are doing really well at educating their students, what do their homework profile look like? That's an excellent, excellent question. Um, they have less. And, and it's interesting because the, the anti-homework, and there are people who actually campaign against homework still today, and they always cite that fact. Um, the top scoring Asian countries in particular have almost no homework, actually. But you have to dig a little bit deeper. And that is, and I, I, like I said, I studied a lot of different countries and I've traveled and visited those schools. That doesn't mean they're not doing academic work at home. They do tons of academic work at home. It's just not assigned as homework because homework is a, considered a remedial activity. And it almost carries, it means you're having a problem with something if you have homework. But uh, if you ask a different question, if you ask the question, how much time do American kids spend in intellectual activities at home versus other countries? Uh, we're in bad shape. I mean. We don't win that Olympics, you know, I mean, we're great at, we really are great at a lot of things, but that's not, not one of them. Um, so you will have uh, parents working with their children at the kitchen table, you know, in Korea or in Japan or in Eastern Europe, but it's not homework, it's, you know, just academic work the parents giving the child. Eastern Europe's a little bit different, but uh, in the Asian countries in particular. Now, another thing that goes on in the Asian countries is homework that involves basic skills is offloaded to, most kids, uh, by the time they get to eighth grade, are going to two schools. They go to the regular school during the day, and then they go to another school. You know, talk about homework. You, they, 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 it's more than homework, it's two schools. So in Japan, it's called juku. And, uh, they, the kid, what the kids are doing is preparing for an, an exam that, ex, that they have to exam into high schools. So it's a very important exam that they take to decide which high school they go to. And they are, something like 70% of eighth graders in Japan are going to Juku. Uh, in Korea, there is such a huge industry. One teacher created a tutoring program that's used online and he made $2 million selling it. They have these conferences at huge stadiums, like your basketball stadium, where the number one tutor in the country walks out and like the cheering is deafening. And this is to be tutored, uh, you know, to go to high school, to, to be selected, uh, to do well on a high school admissions test. So it's quite true that in Korea and Japan, they don't assign a lot of homework, but there's this other you know, thing going on that really emphasizes academics in the non-school hours. And that's, the, that's really the, the key. Has there, Go ahead. Has there been any studies on um, how much homework versus grades? Like how many students spend, how many hours do students who get the best grades? Yeah, good grades? question. And, this is the longest I've gone ever talking about this issue where somebody hasn't asked, well, is it good or bad, right? I mean, I didn't, in none of my slides that I talk about, what about studies of homework, is it beneficial? And you know, something, that's a tough one. That's tough to answer. Um, on the one hand, we have all kinds of experimental data in cognitive psychology where we know that if you want to learn something, you have to study it. You, you just do, and I don't care whether it's learning how to play the piano or golf or no matter what it is, you must put time in on it, you must practice. And you know, people like Tiger Woods and Michael Jordan know this and they're pretty good at what they do, but they put in billions of hours working at it. And so if you wanna learn how to read and you're not a good reader, you've gotta work at it. And you do, have, you do have to invest time. Now, here's the problem with studying it. There, there are, what are what are called selection effects in terms of really figuring out, is homework beneficial? And here, here's how it works. 
the, the, the younger kids, if you're in first, second, or third grade, and you're coming home with lots of homework, you know what it means? You're, you're having trouble. You're struggling, especially at reading. So any second grader who has a ton of homework probably has a reading problem. And they're coming home, and, they, and they're crying, and they're upset, and they have to do a lot more work than their friends do just to keep up. In high school, by the time the kids get to high school, the selection effect reverses. It's the kids who are going to go to college and who are excellent students, and they're in student government, and they're in band, and they've probably started a business or something. I mean, I don't know how these high school kids do it. And, and, and they take five AP classes, and they've got a ton of homework, and they never sleep, and their parents complain to Time Magazine, right? So, but both of those selection effects when you then compare. So at the high school level, you're kind of comparing, and all the studies of high school show that more homework is correlated with, with higher grades and higher achievement, right? But some of that is the population, they self-select into courses that give them more homework, and they happen to be the best students, they, and they happen to love being students, and they do well, like a lot of you. Um, at the other end, though, with little kids, you get the opposite kind of thing, where you find out that homework is correlated with low test scores, and it's for the reason that I pointed out earlier. So to, to give a really long answer here, it's tough to study that issue of um, is it beneficial or not. There, nevertheless, there have been some, and most of these are economists who have tried to do it. Julian Butts at San Diego, I think, has the best study, where he had access to all of San Diego's uh, student records, and he surveyed the kids at various points in time and did longitudinal analysis of homework. And his finding was really dramatic. It was like an extra half hour a day in math, starting in seventh grade. By the time the student gets to the ninth grade, so just a couple of years later, they're, they're like a year ahead of their peers who did not have the extra half hour. And I think, I think math in particular is one of those subjects where, where a really good controlled study, if we could do random, you know, it's really hard to do any kind of random assignment of kids to a homework condition and a non-homework condition. But if we could somehow come up with a, with a more rigorous design, I think you'd find in math big effects on homework, positive effects. Maybe not so much in other subjects, I don't know. There were some hands back here, yes? It occurs to me that one factor that might affect the amount of time required to do homework would be if a student uh, was not a native English speaker. Have you seen anything that addresses that consideration in terms of looking at the amount of time it takes? I have not seen any breakout of English language learners on homework. No, I haven't. I've seen breakouts by race and by socioeconomic level. And the, the you know, the, the worrisome factor, like with socioeconomic level, is the, the kid from a very wealthy family who has a ton of homework, parents will hire tutors, and often do. Whereas the kid in a family with low resources, the parents don't have the money to do that. And so you wind up with a, if, if, you, if you essentially throw a big important part of schooling onto the home, then any differences among the homes then will, will be exacerbated. Yes? Is there a reason why there's a difference between high schoolers' popular belief of homework and the data that the studies show? Say that again. I said, did you find a reason why there's a difference between high schoolers' popular belief of homework and the, dip and the data that the studies show? Why do we believe that there's so much? Or why do the high schoolers believe that there's so much and the data shows something completely different? Um, well, I think, I think the popular press shapes our view of this culturally. I really do. I mean, I think we get, we get lots of signals from the popular press that, and there are all kinds of misconceptions about, about test scores and testing and what they show. And so when you've got these magazines, and you know, when you're talking about, P, all those covers came out within six months, and you're hitting a broad population when you're talking about Time and People magazine, that's a different population, and uh, Newsweek. Um, that they can really control the discourse. So I, I think, uh, we do go through periods of time, and believe me, if it's showing up there, it's probably on NBC, it's on CBS, it's, it's on the internet, it's, uh, you know, it's everywhere, and these beliefs start to get uh, adopted, even though they're not true. I'll tell you, I'm writing about one right now, 
and um, it's going to be in the Brownson report that comes out in about two months, about myths dealing with international testing. For example, there is a myth. Everybody believes the United States once led the world in math and science on tests, and that we kind of, you know, fell from grace or something. We never led the world, ever. We've always been at the bottom. We have always sucked when it comes to international tests. I mean, it's just a fact. And so I'm going to start this article with, uh, you know, an ab a, a, a uh, not a PDF, I'm, a scan of the table of findings from the very first international test in math. It was given in 1962. So this is, what, 48 years ago. There were 13 nations. You know where we came in? 12th. So that was the first one ever, and we came in 12th out of 13. And Sweden came in 13th. <laughs> and in the last test internationally, we came in about in the middle, but now there's 60 countries taking it, and most of them are much poorer nations than the United States. Um, we came in about the middle, a little above the middle, not terrible. And Sweden came in below us. So, and if you go back and look at the original 13, we still come in 12th, and Sweden still comes in 13th. So this idea there was some golden age of American education, that is complete nonsense. Americans have always been kind of ambivalent. We like our geniuses. We like to think of ourselves as well-educated. But it's like the homework thing. We're not going to work too hard at it. You know? I mean, we have other values. Yes? Does the homework data vary from state to state? I don't know. I, I have never seen state data. I would imagine that it does just because um, we, we do know that in, just in terms of sort of educational cultures, there are differences from state to state. Do you think it would be like a dramatic difference or do you think it would be pretty average from state to state? I think there might be some dramatic differences uh, with New England and, you know, it, almost on every indicator, New England and the upper Midwest leads the other states. Um, the West comes in below them, those two regions, and uh, the South comes in dead last. And that's, that's true on almost every educational indicator you can find going back 100 years. It's amazing. So there are these sort of you know, cultural aspects that, that states develop. One thing I did one time was I took the date you know, the, here, here would be one very crude indicator, and it's kind of fun, uh, historically, on how committed a state is to education. Just simply take the date that the state first formed an office of education. And if you take that and correlate it with test scores today, you get a nice correlation. The states that, you know, obviously cared about education, uh, Massachusetts was the first state to ever create a state office of education. Those of you who follow your NAEP data, National Assessment of Educational Progress, knows that, know that Massachusetts comes in first on all of our tests of math and reading. It's kind of interesting. Now, the one kicker there is with the South. See, the South didn't have a public school system until the Civil War. They had no public school system. And the system that they got was imposed on them by the Army, by the Union. That was one of the things that happened at, by virtue of them losing the Civil War. They had a public school system imposed on them. Now, they let it later made that a segregated public school system. But, so the South had this kind of resistance. You know, by 1860, uh, all the states in New England had public schools. Massachusetts had th over 3,000 public schools when the first shots were fired at Lexington and Concord. You know, there's a, just a rich tradition of each town putting money into building schools, educating kids. The South had no public schools. Even the Southern colonies at the same time. You know, Jefferson coming from Virginia. How many of our first 10 presidents come from Virginia? A bunch of them. Uh, no public schools. Yes? Do you think that um, the reason why we correlate extra homework you know, is because of the <coughs> increase during middle school? So we think that we're receiving much more homework because it does actually 
have an increase in that period of time. And so kids start, oh my gosh, I'm having so much more homework than I did when I was in elementary school. And then it kind of tapers down. Matt, that's some of it. But, but I actually think it's a little different. I, I think as Americans, we, um, we just see childhood as differently than other cultures, where other cultures see childhood as preparing to be an adult, which means studying and learning everything you possibly can. And there's a payoff for that. And Americans would have this idea of being a well-rounded person. So sure, you might be, have intellectual interests, but you also play sports. You, uh, oh, there's, here's, a, here's a great question. There's a poll at Phi uh, Delta Kappa where they ask parents, what would you rather have your child be? An A student with very few friends or a C student with a lot of friends? And parents always pick the C student. Now, I tell my friends in you know, France this, and they just go, oh, you stupid Americans. You know, I mean, they just think that is the weirdest thing ever. Uh, like, they have their whole life to make friends. And the French are not the toughest on this. Uh, but, uh, so it, we just, we, we see childhood as a, uh, just a different, you know, we believe that there needs to be a healthy component of play, that there has to be a healthy component of learning how to get along with others. And after all, I mean, that's probably why the U.S. Uh, has done as well as it has for two centuries, is that we do teach our kids how to get along with other people. That's a really important thing, and other countries have problems with that. But um, I, think, I think it's more that than any kind of, like, shock at middle school or anything. I think it's more of, if, if a child has two hours of homework every night, that just seems like an awful lot to be spending on, you know, just an intellectual activity, where in some countries that, that's just a warm-up. Yeah. Any difference between public education and private education? Yes. Yeah. Private uh, schools uh, have more homework, especially Catholic schools. But Catholic schools dominate the private space. They're about 75% of private schools, so. and that, that leads to this big, big advantage. But you know there are offbeat private schools. There, the progressive movement of the '60s. There were a number of private schools that were founded that were against homework, and um, and they they don't offer it. But, but they have typical private school student has more homework. Other questions? Well, thank you. I've enjoyed it. You've been a great audience. Thanks. <laughs> <laughs>